All right, thank you for coming, everyone. I'm really grateful to have all of you. Uh, we do have a sixth committee member on the phone. That's Dr. John Hedenbrun at BYU. Hey, John. Hello, everyone. And I, we have Dr. Balde, Dr. Bonacays, Dr. Edgar, and Dr. Balde. Um, yeah, thank you. So my topic is dynamic optimization of energy systems that have thermal energy storage. So I'm showing here a picture of our campus, which is a big part of my research. We've considered our campus to be an independent energy system. And I've had a really good opportunity to work closely with several other students and with directly with our utilities and energy management group to study our campus as an independent energy system. And there have been some unique things that we've been able to do as a part of my and my colleagues' research. So this is motivation. Why do we need energy storage? So it comes as no surprise to anyone in this room, I'm sure, that solar energy is intermittent. and the way we use energy is not intermittent. We want to use energy on demand. And as you can see, no one no one has a demand profile that looks like that. So energy storage is a good way to take that energy, store it when there's excess energy available, and then we can harness that energy later when we need it. So it's not just supply that's intermittent. We also are dealing with transient demand. This is a, a grid profile from the, the entire ERCOT grid. This is for a July day in 2011. This was an extreme day, I'll admit, but as you can see, our total demand for the state of Texas is shifting from about 37 gigawatts to over 65 gigawatts in a period of just 12 hours. So our strategy now is basically to build a lot of power plants so that we have enough power capacity to meet that peak demand. But an alternative, which would certainly help for a lot of efficiency reasons, which I'll explain later, would be to be able to shift some of this demand down to here and help flatten out that profile a little bit. Is storage the only way to do that? Uh, there are several ways of storage. I'm not sure what you're alluding to. Is exactly. storage the only way to shift demand? I would say storage in some form of another is. I mean, we could shift the way we use energy by encouraging homeowners to essentially, yeah, they can change when they're using electricity. So there's there are other ways. There are demand response. Okay. <laughs> Price signals too. Perfect. <laughs> so storage is not the only way to do that. So just to give you an overview, I've covered quite a range of topics in my during my four years here. They are all generally centralized around this theme of dynamic optimization of energy systems that have a specific kind of energy storage, a thermal energy storage, as the acronym TES. So I, I've covered a couple of different topics. I've focused on two basic types of systems. The first of these is a solar thermal system, where you use the sun's sunlight to make heat, and then you can use that heat to power a conventional power cycle, like a breaking cycle or break cycle. The other system, which I talked about earlier, is a district energy system, which our, our campus is a district energy system, where you can produce energy in some form of another and deliver it to the area immediately surrounding. So in solar thermal, some of the topics I've covered are modeling a solar thermal power plant and then optimizing that power plant. And naturally, this is dynamic optimization over a 24-hour period. With the district energy system, there has been a lot that has gone into this. The things I'm going to highlight today in my presentation are being able to forecast the demand for that 24 hours. That's a critical piece of the dynamic optimization problem. So I want to demonstrate that we do have that ability, and it works quite well. And then the optimization itself. So if you're talking about, as well as I showed you on that first slide, we're, we're talking about enormous amounts of energy. So if we're really going to make a dent in flattening out that profile, we need some very large-scale energy storage. And I haven't found a better way to explain this, but thermal energy storage can be like this guy. He's a heavy lifter, kind of a brute force technology. So he lifts things up and puts them down. So in thermal energy storage, what we do is we heat things up and cool them down, or vice versa. So you can heat things up and store that energy, then when you want to extract that energy, you cool down your storage medium and deliver the heat to your heat sink. <coughs> so thermal energy storage is somewhat analogous to this gentleman who is just a, maybe doesn't have all the brains, but definitely has the brawn. My research is uh, focused on taking a, an energy storage technology like this and making it a little bit smarter. So we can take a technology that's, that's low cost and has a, the opportunity to make a big impact and turn it into something that's a little bit smarter. And I do that by considering the thermal storage in the context of a complete system. This slide here is essentially my whole dissertation in a nutshell. So 
it's looking at a model of a system where we have two different generators. I've labeled the power that each generator produces, P1 and P2. And this plot would be the, the combined efficiency of the two. So if we looked at the system and our objective was just to maximize the efficiency, you can see our most efficient point would be right here where we're using purely generator one and not generator two at all. Naturally, you don't produce energy just to be efficient. You produce it because you need to meet some load and deliver that energy to someone. So we so we take away one of those degrees of freedom and we add in a constraint that the sum of those has to be equal to some total power demand. So that reduces our degrees of freedom for this really simple abstraction down to one. And if we're looking at this is that same curve I showed you earlier, but just to remove the units there. So if we're looking at this particular time of the day and we have to meet demand right here, that means this line would represent the total demand that we have to meet. And we want to meet that total demand and at the same time maximize efficiency. So our optimal point would be right there. We're still not using P2, which would be analogous to a peaking power plant. We're just using a generator one there. Later in the day, though, when we have a peak energy usage, we're going to be looking at something more like this, where we need to have, we need to switch on that peaking power plant. That takes our optimal solution down to here. So we have that one degree of freedom at each of these points in time. We can move anywhere along this line until we hit our optimal solution. If you add an energy storage to the mix, though, you, uh, you can shift energy from the peak to the trough, and you can perhaps operate a little bit more efficiently. So we, so in that case, we increase our power here. So we now can do everything at this time point. It's still on P1. We can still at this time one on our generator number one. And we remove that peaking power plant from even having to run. So now we have this new degree of freedom where we can shift these lines completely because now we don't necessarily have to generate the same exact amount of power that line we can produce extra here and we can produce less here. And in this very simple and ideal abstraction, we shift the demand here down and we shift the demand here up. And now we have two new optimal points at those two points. And you can see our efficiency here has improved and our efficiency here has improved. So that's essentially what I'm trying to do in my research, is to use the degrees of freedom and the flexibility that thermal energy storage gives you so that you can operate optimally over an entire time horizon and not just at a single point in time. So dynamic optimization, now you have essentially infinite degrees of freedom because we, you can move these lines along here continuously. We take away some of those degrees of freedom by discretizing the system, looking at only time increments. And generally, um, this could be done in, on a 15 minute interval or on an hour interval or whatever is best for your system. We're trying to take advantage of the flexibility that storage gives us. So there's a term often used in reference to dynamic programming that degrees of freedom are give you what's called the curse of dimensionality. So in my research, I consider that both a blessing and a curse. We have new degrees of freedom. We have new flexibility that can make our system perform better. But there still is a curse of dimensionality that these problems become exponentially more difficult to solve. So back to our overview slide. So I'm going to focus now on the solar thermal system and a model that I developed. It's a first principles model. I used a fairly simple storage method, a two tank method, where you, you have two tanks full of some fluid. I use a synthetic oil as my fluid. This is the direct method because it uh, you use the same fluid to collect heat as you use to store. So essentially, you store energy. I mean, you store your fluid in its cold state in one tank. You run that through your heat stores, that heats up the fluid, and then you take that heated fluid, which is now stored energy, and put it in your hot tank. These tanks are very well insulated, so heat losses are generally not a large concern unless you're going out beyond a few hours to store energy. So in the case of the solar thermal system, our heat source is a parabolic uh, solar field where you have a field, a large land area, and you concentrate the, the sunlight onto a, a tube which runs along the focal point of your mirrors that heats up the fluid. So in that case, this, these parabolic mirrors are a heat source. Our heat sink would be a power block, or it could be even an industrial heat exchanger to provide steam for a, a chemical plant. So solar thermal is very nice because it works with conventional power cycles. We're storing heat in a pretty simple way by heating up a fluid, so it is a lower cost storage system. If you compare this to photovoltaics, it's a great technology, but one of the benefits that solar thermal has is that Storing energy is a little bit easier because we have thermal energy storage, which integrates very well with it. This is the model I developed. So the model is based on energy balances. This is the tube that runs along the focal point of those mirrors. 
So inside the tube, we have our heat transfer fluid, that synthetic oil. We have this absorber pipe, which carries the fluid, and then we have a glass envelope that goes around. So essentially, the glass envelope is trying to recreate the greenhouse effect, or it's trying to get all the heat in there, when it, and then when it turns to infrared radiation, where this glass envelope does a pretty good job of trapping all the heat inside, so we, so we minimize our heat losses by radiation. So I do an energy balance on each of those sections, the heat transfer fluid, the pipe, and the glass envelope. And those show up here as partial differential equations. Here's our heat transfer fluid energy balance, the absorber energy balance, and then the glass envelope energy balance. Those PDEs are converted to ODEs by discretizing the system. I've shown my discretization here. So we do an energy balance on each section, each discrete section of that absorber tube to get our overall energy balance. Yeah, I can see it. Um, but <laughs> okay. All right. Is that any better? Okay. All right, so the storage tank model is... Okay, on the right-hand side, so here we just have, we have flow going through the system. Um, we have convection between the absorber pipe and the heat transfer fluid. On the absorber, we have that same convection term. We have radiated heat transfer between the absorber pipe and the glass envelope, mm -hmm. where this term here represents the view factor between two concentric cylinders. And then here, this is our source term, where the sunlight comes in and hits the system. I've left off the how Q absorbed is defined, but it's defined as a function of how efficient, what the reflectivity of the mirrors is, and what the transmissivity of the glass envelope is, and what the absorptivity of the uh, absorber pipe is. And finally, the glass envelope has that same radiative term. It also radiates to ambient. Okay. And then, Yes. All right, so our source sink model is fairly simple. We do a mass balance on the system on each on each tank, and then we also do an energy balance, non-constant volume. So we have that combined V and T term, which we separate out um, using the total differential. So the first uh, topic I looked at was just developing this model. I wanted to examine the effect that energy storage can have on regulating a system like this. So if you can imagine, if you think back to that first plot of the solar energy, um, there's not really much you can do with that unless you're trying to use energy exactly as it's available. So energy storage um, allows us to regulate both the temperature and the power separately because we have these two tanks as a buffer. So what I've done here is applied a fairly traditional control scheme. We use the flow from the cold tank traveling through the solar field. We use that flow as a manipulated variable to regulate the temperature coming out of the solar field. And the nice thing about having the tanks is they provide a buffer so that this is done, that flow is changing so we keep a constant temperature here, but we integrate that flow into our hot tank. Now we have this stored energy that we tap into so we can effectively regulate the power output. So the objective in this problem is to try and regulate power to one thermal megawatt and I've used a pretty generic model for the heat sink there. It's a pretty simple boiler here, but you can take that if you have this constant source of heat, you can easily run a brain heat cycle off of that. So the objective here is to regulate with one thermal megawatt of power. This system will try and do that completely with solar. Then when the solar, when you don't have any, any more energy available, you assume that you have a backup source of energy, natural gas, to come on and then to meet your thermal megawatt with the backup source of energy. How do you do your equipment side of that? You've got the size of parabolic collectors, um, storage tanks, etc. How do you do that? So there was some optimization that went into sizing everything. I looked at some software that was uh, several years ago. The software is called, it used to be called Solar Advisor Model. I think it's now called Systems Advisor Model from NREL. So essentially, I it was an optimization problem, but I solved it by enumeration, looking at different sizes of the storage tank versus versus different sizes of the solar field. And I tried to meet that one thermal megawatt. So what I found from that was that your optimal storage was about eight to nine hours. And I'm, so I'm using eight hours of full load storage in this study. So from the perspective of what you're doing right now, you could just Agree that you just pick that number out of the air. I know that you use some tool to do it, but you don't necessarily assert any great significance to that, right? Correct. It's a, right. It's a good, it depends yeah. sounds good, right? I mean, eight hours sounds like a good meeting, it covers you. Right? <laughs> sure, yeah. 
So you can still eat them. Yeah, I yeah, and this plant is actually a very small scale. This wouldn't be economical unless you scale it up. I mean, a building plant on the order of 400 megawatts now. So that one thermal megawatt, which would be about a quarter of a megawatt electrical power, isn't going to do much for you. But this is a nice system to investigate the control scheme and then to investigate how to optimize that control scheme. So from a control point of view, it was a really nice problem to be used to make to do these investigations. So the results of that study are so I've I performed this study for several different scenarios. This particular scenario, I have the, we have us, we assume that there's a, some cloud cover in the morning. Then later in the day, the sun comes out from behind the clouds, and now you have a full amount of solar power available. So essentially, storage enables you to control your system much better. It makes your power dispatchable. You can store energy here, albeit not as much as on a sunny day. Once you have that stored energy, then you can turn on the flow from your hot tank through your heat sink, and now you have this power which is dispatchable. And I haven't looked at pricing, different pricing scenarios or real-time pricing or anything. My, my main objective here is just to highlight that you can make this dispatchable. So you could just as easily, because you have now stored energy to tap into, you can just as easily ramp up the way the, the rate that you're delivering heat to your heat sink. So, this slide illustrates how well we do power control by having the storage in there. We also do temperature control very well because now that's a, essentially a separate control problem where we have those two different flow rates that we can manipulate fairly independently. So this is the temperature coming out of the solar field and you can see we very effectively regulate that using the feed forward and feedback element of our controller. And this is the temperature in our storage which is, stays fairly constant. It drips off, drops off gradually at the end of the day but the tank is essentially empty here. You can see that the flow rates very closely mirror the way that energy is available. So the result of this study was if you take the same size solar plant, which is sized um, to meet that one thermal megawatt, um, if you insert storage in there, you increase your solar share. So that's the total amount of energy that you get from the sun. Uh, you increase that up to 64%. So storage really helps your system. You don't have to put as much capital cost into building a giant solar collector field. Now you have storage, and you can use a smaller collector field to get a higher capacity factor in your power plant. But, but this this 64 percent is you have the same solar field in both cases, right? Yes. Okay. The same with and without storage, I get to harvest more of the solar the solar power. So you you find a way to Energy that Essentially, yeah. The field is oversized in the other case. So, so it's, it's pretty, I mean, how, how do you throw it away in that loop? Mean, so uh, when I did this, I used a, essentially a radiative heat pipe that was just open to ambient, but you could do this by actually shutting off the mirrors, rotating them out of uh, off, off axis. Okay. So storage, the nice thing is that storage takes a system that otherwise so the other benefit of having storage is that you can do this. Otherwise, your system is really difficult to control and actually almost useless because you can't deliver power on demand. So storage takes something like that and turns it into a system that is now operational where you can make it through cloud cover. You can even extend the production into the evening hours. So now we're going to take that same system and we're going to look at what we can do, how we can improve performance by optimizing the system. And again, that is dynamic optimization. This work is done assuming that you have a pretty good ability to forecast the irradiance levels over that 24-hour period. I've considered that to be out of the scope of my research, but I can cite several sources where they're doing that type of research and doing a fairly good job of predicting how much radiation will be available based on meteorological variables. So we're looking at the same system here. We're going to relax some of those constraints that we had before. That gives us more degrees of freedom. Now, instead of controlling to a constant temperature coming out of the solar field, we're going to be looking at optimal temperature control, where at any time during that 24-hour period, we can change the temperature of what is coming out of the field and what we're storing. And that's within bounds, of course. We also give our system the ability to bypass storage. So this helps to save entropy. If you, you don't want to store a fluid at a certain temperature and then mix it with some other fluid, coming out at a different temperature, that generates entropy and you're, you're essentially losing some of the energy that you could extract, some of the useful energy that you could extract. We're going to also consider hybrid operation of the system where 
Whereas before we were trying to meet, it was a kind of an either or scenario. We either meet the full thermal megawatt by solar or we meet it all by natural gas. So if we relax that constraint and consider a hybrid operation of the system where some combination of solar and natural gas can meet your thermal megawatt, you'll see that the results are, are substantially better in certain scenarios. So we're still trying to meet the one thermal megawatt load, and just now we're trying to do that with a combination of solar and natural gas at any point in time. So we have that supplemental fuel here, and I haven't done a really extensive modeling here. I've assumed you have this natural gas that you can just burn whenever you need to to get you up to the thermal megawatt. So the dynamic optimization problem is, is simplified here. We're trying to minimize the total supplemental power that we need to give our system. So that would be the, the rate of natural gas energy that we're pumping into the system, subject to meeting all of our differential equations, which are the mass and energy balances of the system. There are also several algebraic constraints and several inequality constraints in the system. The C represents a function where there are a lot of different tuning factors that go into it that I, it took me several months to get everything just right to where we get the nice results that you'll see in a few slides. So this was initially a PDAE system, a partial differential and algebraic equation system. We had uh, spatially dependent derivatives in the solar field. We got rid of those by discretizing using finite difference methods and turning it into an ODE system. We also have differential and algebraic equations that are temporally dependent. We get rid of those by using a simultaneous solution method. And I, I shouldn't say we get rid of those. We approximate. So we approximate the differential state profile using polynomials, um, using a simultaneous solution method. So we have, we try and solve so that those differential state variables match at certain points in time. And those points are known as the collocation points. So this problem ends up being I've divided up the 24 hour period into 15 minute increments. And we get roughly 15,000 variables in this problem. 288 degrees of freedom, so there are three different flow rates in the system that we can change independently, and those decisions are made every 15 minutes. So this was solved using a software called Advanced Process Monitor, which was developed by our colleague on the phone, Dr. John Hedengren. I found this software to be extremely useful in solving especially this problem and some other interesting model predictive control problems. So Tony. Uh, so C represents, so there are a couple of places where I found putting in hard constraints made the problem really intractable. So I had uh, constraints on the temperatures in the field. So theoretically, you shouldn't go above about 700 Kelvin or your fluid will start to decompose. So what I did there was I introduced the soft constraints instead. So yeah, so generally penalty terms. Yes. <laughs> so those are actually. Also, also point out that you know, all the variables are continuous, right? There are no, yes. no binary variables. Or anything like this that. is a this is a purely continuous problem. Yes. Um, so this so with some really careful tuning. I mean, this took me a long time and a lot of simulation. This, this problem was initially once I finally got some decent looking results, it was taking me about eight hours to solve it. Um, I with a lot of meddling and a lot of tuning things, I got this down to about 10 minutes. So this is something you can actually implement in real time. And you could make those changes about every 15 minutes if you had a faster computer. And you could do things even quicker. So now we're going to look at the optimal results from the system. So now this is the, the corresponding plot. We have the same amount of solar radiation available. We're now looking at hybrid operations. So what our optimal solution tells us is that at the beginning of the day, instead of trying to meet that full megawatt by solar energy, we meet it partially by solar energy. The rest would be met, up, met by the natural gas. So we turn on natural gas, and we operate in this hybrid mode. And I'll explain why that is a little bit later. So when the sun comes out, and now we have the full amount of solar energy that we'd expect on a sunny day, we ramp up our the total solar power up to one. And then gradually, as the sun starts going down, we, that energy tapers off. So we have this energy stored in our hot tank, and we're gradually decreasing the amount until we get down pretty close to zero by the end of the 24-hour period. The tank would be empty at this point. So this is where the real benefits come in. And most of this is pretty intuitive once you think through it. So earlier in the day, we don't have as much energy available. We collect energy at lower temperatures. Those temperatures correspond to a higher mass flow rate through our field here. 
So if, if you think about this field, we're losing heat by radiation. And if we're trying to get really high temperatures with not enough solar energy available, in the previous example, we had to turn our mass flow rates way down. So what, essentially what that's doing is increasing your residence times through the solar fields. So you're radiating a lot more heat and you're losing a lot more heat, you're still collecting it at high temperatures, but you're not collecting as much because so much is being lost. So in this example, we collect heat at a lower temperature. <laughs> we collect heat at a lower temperature when we don't have as high quality heat. Then once we have that higher quality heat, we get that much higher temperature. There is some a little bit of bypass going on here where we don't want to mix the two different temperatures. And then again, we get the same kind of effect where we, oh, yeah, I just went that already. We get the effect where you tape, gradually taper off the way you use the energy. So this utilizes those degrees of freedom. So one big benefit of optimization is that, well, first of all, we've relaxed a lot of degrees of freedom that we hadn't before. And now we use optimization to tell us exactly where to put those degrees of freedom so that we get an optimal result. So instead of just being operational, the storage lets our system be optimal. So there are a lot of things going on here besides just the storage. The hybrid operation is really critical, and the optimal temperature heat collection is critical. But storage lets us shift the way we're doing things, where we store heat at lower temperatures here and and maximize, essentially we're maximizing the area under this gray curve, which would be the total amount of heat that we get. So I ran this for several different scenarios, and those are summarized here. So the first scenario was this partly cloudy day that I showed you. We looked at a day with just a lot of no cloud cover at all. And then a day where there's just intermittent cloud cover. And you can imagine a day like this with this giant solar power plant. Your plant is basically a big hunk of metal out there. It's not, you're not going to be able to get it up to the temperatures you need to do much of anything on this particular day. But if we were able to have some idea of how to forecast this, we could do much better here. So we're looking at total efficiency, the total solar energy efficiency. So this is the total solar energy that they actually deliver to your heat sink divided by the total that's available. On a sunny day, you do a little bit better, about a 10% increase. The part of the cloudy day that I showed you is slightly better. The results are the best when it's intermittent cloud cover, when there's not much available. Previously, that lower grade heat, you wouldn't be able to do much of anything. You'd get really high heat losses and collect only a small fraction of that energy. But if you run in this system where you say, okay, well, we know that we're not going to get really high grade solar heat. We're getting lower temperature solar heat. We're going to make whatever use we can of it. So on that particular day, we improved the amount of solar energy that you collect by 49%. And then, so the nice part about this is that you rely on the natural gas to get you up to temperature. So you'd still get the same Carnot efficiency in your power cycle because now you have natural gas you can tap into to get you the rest of it a little bit. All right, now we're going to move on to the district energy system. Before you do that, Greg, um, yes. your data is within this optimization is the information about the sort the insulation, the radiance all for the whole day, right? It's yes. deterministic. Yes. Even though yes. it's been, so in practice you have to implement this in some sort of MPC setup, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. So okay. That's, that's and I do have a slide it's in the appendix about how you do that exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so you do this on a rolling basis. You'd solve the problem for 15 minutes, take in the latest forecast and the latest weather information, solve it. Then later in the day, when your states change, you could resolve the problem and keep so you'd implement only every 15 minutes. All right, so we're going to move on to the district energy system. This has been a really, a really fun project. We've gotten to look at up close and personal to a very familiar energy system, which is our campus here at UT. So it's a really unique campus. We have our own combined heat and power. And it's unique in the sense that it sort of has everything. There are campuses that have combined heat and power. There are campuses that have central cooling and thermal storage. And there may be others that have these other elements, but UT has essentially everything you would want so that we can run really as an independent energy system. We import natural gas. From there, we generate our own power. We generate our own heat from a central location. We generate our own, uh, well, we generate chilled water at central location. So all these different energy sources are distributed out via pipeline or electrical line to the entire campus. So this is a really interesting test bed to apply some of the same basic methodology. The way I've solved these problems are very different than the solar power plant problem, but it's essentially the same idea. You use the thermal energy storage. In this case, the thermal energy storage isn't a hot fluid. Now we're storing a cold fluid, chilled water, and we store it at about four degrees Celsius. 
just above its freezing point, and then we can shift our cooling loads so that we can run our cooling equipment at night and then use it the following day. So essentially, I want to apply the same the same methodology here. So these are what the loads look like for our system, and this is a, in late July, August 2012, and on that particular day, that particular week, sorry, the, you can see the dry bulb temperature and relative humidity are fluctuating almost like sine waves here, so it's very regular, and you can see that the loads that correspond to that temperature and humidity are also fairly regular, especially the electrical load. The cooling load is a, an interesting case because an operator who's telling the, the chillers when to turn on and off can just suddenly shut off a chiller, and then the measurement we get is suddenly different. So things like that you may see happening here or here. So it's a really difficult one to forecast because there is a human element in there. But and then steam. This is a, a summer day, so the campus isn't using much steam, but there is still some some steam load. They use steam to for process heat around mm -hmm. campus. They also use that steam to do reheating in buildings where they they cool the air down, they cool the air to squeeze out all the water essentially, and then they provide a little bit of heat to bring it back up so the rooms don't become too too cold. All right, so this is the day in February, and this is this is a week in February, excuse me. And as you can see, there's no regularity here at all. So the temperature and humidity are just all over the place, and correspondingly so, all the loads are all over the place. And I would like to know these loads are. So electrical is obviously megawatts electric, but cooling and heating be thermal megawatts. But I wanted to put them on the same scale so you could kind of compare how they're doing against each other. So this is much more challenging to forecast, but if you look really closely, you can see that that they follow temperature and humidity quite closely. Just as a correlation, so just to measure how much those loads are changing and how much they're correlated to temperature and humidity, I plotted this. I calculated the correlation coefficient for the different loads. So here are all the correlation coefficients corresponding to the electrical load. It's perfectly correlated with itself, but it's very strongly correlated with cooling, very strongly correlated with temperature. I was quite surprised at how high this was. It's also very strongly correlated to heat, although inversely so. Less so with relative humidity, but this plot indicates there's still some information in the relative humidity that we can get out of our system and attempt to, to model and forecast what these loads are going to be in advance. So you can see the same kind of things going on here. So cooling and heating, sorry, cooling and electrical very closely with each other. And then inversely to that is the heating load. So what fraction of the electrical production is used to cool? It's approximately a third. So it's obvious that it should be correlated, right? Right, yes, exactly. And the cooling also corresponds. When people show up on campus, they start using their cooling, they start using their lab equipment at the same time. So yeah, so it is fairly obvious. So we're going to take a look at the first just to yeah. understand this. Uh, yeah. So it's approximately a third. That number is over the course of an entire year. Mm -hmm. So that's like integrated total over a year. So it would obviously be a lot more in the summer and a lot less in the winter. So we took a crack at being able to forecast what those loads would be. Given information that would be available now, we can take in the weather forecast for the next 24 to 48 hours. We'll, we can measure things from the plant now with our load. And Use that in a model to try and predict what we're going to be over the next 24 hours. So I looked at several different models here, and this was also Akshay's Recursal was a big part of this work. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge him. It's also his birthday today, so he's here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to submit someone to this on my birthday. Sorry, Christian. So we looked at several different models of varying orders. So we looked at a fairly basic linear model. We're looking at so these would be ARX model, so that's autoregressive with exogenous inputs. So the autoregressive portion of that is we we look at what the previous load is, and then we so we use previous measured loads to as a good reference point where our load is going to go. The exogenous input part comes from what this uh, vector. Data. So this would contain all the weather information, what's your temperature and humidity now, as well as a forecast of what they're going to be into the future. The linear model, we also added in terms constants for each hour of the day. So you can adjust that, whether you're at 12 o'clock today or whether you're at 5 o'clock tomorrow, those constants would be would change from day to day and from hour to hour and from month to month. There's also a constant term in there. So we also looked at a nonlinear model with essentially the same inputs. 
So the autoregressive part of the model, so we take all of our inputs, we feed them into this neural network model. This is for the nonlinear portion of this. Then we, if we want to keep forecasting further into the future, we feed that back and then we can make predictions recursively into the future. So these are, I won't get too much into the details here, but these are the adjusted R squared values just to compare which models are best to model our system. So I want to highlight this one. So this is just a static neural network. The inputs would be weather, temperature and humidity, and the time variable. So what hour of the day is it, what day of the week, and what month of the year is it. So with those variables alone, we're actually able to get a really good forecast with adjusted R squared values. Approaching one, the electrical tends to be the hardest one to predict. You can see if you look at, if you compare those to the same, essentially the same model, but we take away the time, you can see that the cooling model is still fairly good, but the heating and electrical are highly dependent on time or occupancy in the building. So those go way down. I'll skip over the linear ARX model. They weren't as good, but still had some pretty good predictive value. All right, so this one, let me, uh, so looking at that bottom row now, you can see that once we add in the autoregressive component, now our models get really good with the, the worst R squared being 0.93. So this just demonstrates that we are able to forecast these loads with some regularity. This is just a sample. I've looked at hundreds of these. And we generally stay within those uncertainty bounds. So the uncertainty bounds are calculated fairly simply. I took the standard deviation for, for each 24 hours after I made the prediction. So I did this, fit this using 8760 data points for every hour for a year. And then I took the standard deviation of the error for each load over the 24 hour period and calculated the uncertainty bounds from there. So these are 95% confidence bounds. And we and those bounds are generally very accurate. We're about 19 times out of 20. Our forecast is within those confidence bounds. So even though we're getting some pretty good fluctuation here, we're able to capture that fairly well using this autoregressive model. You'll notice that the bounds have this funnel shape, but then they gradually, so after about hour 10, they essentially level out, they stop getting bigger. That's due to the, the big impact that just weather and humidity have. We no longer really need that autoregressive nature to forecast. So we can forecast indefinitely, assuming that our weather forecast is good, we can forecast out 48 or 72 hours into the future. So, now that we have proven the ability to forecast those loads, we're going to look at optimizing the system. It's a very interesting system, and it makes for a very complex optimization problem. This was a, a very challenging problem to solve, and there were this was a very challenging problem to get all these models together. I did quite a bit of the modeling myself, but I also had a lab mates, predominantly Kriti Kapoor and Jung Kim, helping out with the modeling part of this whole process. So the system takes in natural gas. As I mentioned, it, we only import natural gas and water, and essentially everything else is we provide. But this is just to give you an idea of the different flows and interrelations between the different pieces of equipment. So we take in natural gas at our gas turbine in the heat recovery steam generator, abbreviated HERSIG, which I do that in later slides. There's an auxiliary boiler and an extraction steam turbine. So essentially our, our gas turbine burns that gas to produce electricity that's sent to the campus to the cooling towers and pumps, and then to all of the chillers. The waste heat from that gas turbine is fed to the HERSIG, and HERSIG takes that heat. It's basically a giant multi-stage heat exchanger. It takes that waste heat and produces superheated steam. That superheated steam is sent to an extraction steam turbine, and the extraction steam turbine will drop the pressure from about 450 PSI down to about 160. That 160 PSI steam is sent out to campus where it's distributed to, to make hot water and heating and heat all of our labs here on campus. But we also produce extra power. We don't, so the heat that you generate here won't necessarily align perfectly with your heating loads in the campus. So you can actually, if you wanted to, you could fully condense that steam and use it only to produce power. So that power, again, goes to the campus, powers our different cooling towers and pumps. The chillers, they produce chilled water at about four degrees Celsius. Some of that cool, uh, chilled water goes to our turbine inlet cooling system, whose job is essentially to densify the air before it's fed to the gas turbine. And we can also, the, the key component of the whole system is our ability to store that thermal energy. So it's a very interesting problem because all the different pieces of equipment are, are highly coupled and we can't 
So for example, we can't increase our turbine inlet cooling without worrying about our chilled water consumption, which then impacts our uh, power generation. But at the same time, we get more power generation by running the turbine inlet cooler. So a lot of this complexity is, is solved when we when we get good models of the system and solve an optimization problem that tells us how we should be running all of these different pieces of equipment. Is the turbine input in, in inlet cooler is that been there forever, or is that a new, relatively recent innovation? I think it's been there for a couple of decades at least. Okay. So it's been there for quite a long time. So here's essentially this is a simplified problem formulation. I have more of the models in the appendix if you'd like to look at them. But essentially, our objective function is to minimize the total cost over that 24 hour period. Um, the cost being our fuel cost. So we consume natural gas in our gas turbine, our HERSIG, and in our boiler. There are certain scenarios where I've solved this problem assuming that we could produce extra power and sell that to the grid or we could buy power. So I've added on this term um, the cost of electricity here and the electricity that we're selling. So that so when we're selling power to the grid, the net power produced would be positive and we and that decreases our total cost. And vice versa when you're buying power from the grid. So there are a lot of decision variables, and remember these are made at every hour. So the total number of these times 24. So we have the load that's placed on each tiller. We have a binary decision variable for each tiller. So I looked at nine tillers total. The campus actually has 11, but two of them are essentially never used. So I just excluded them. They're inefficient. So these binary decision variables tell us whether the tiller is on or off. So that adds another element of complexity to the problem. We have the Turbine in my cooling load here. Um, the, the power plant models are predominantly developed by my colleague, John Kim, and he's developed those models so that your, the input variables are the, the inlet guide vane angles. So there are some, essentially some shutters that regulate how much air is coming into the gas turbine, and you change how much air is coming in by changing those angles. And also, we look at the flow rate, so the gas turbine fuel flow rate, and the first thing in the boiler. We also have the extraction steam flow rate, which is essentially always equal to our steam load. And we have this other decision variable, how much power we're trying to export. So we need to meet all of our loads. So this is our electrical load. So the power that we produce with the gas turbine and the steam turbine minus whatever we're selling has to be greater than what the campus uses, what the chillers use, and what the auxiliaries for the chilling system use. The cooling load has to be met. So the sum of all the cooling load that we meet on all the chillers minus what we're storing has to be greater than our campus cooling load minus the turbine inlet cooling load. And then this one's a lot simpler. We have to have enough steam to meet our campus steam load. So I divided this into one hour time intervals, predominantly because that's when, how we've done the forecasting. That's when meteorological variables are typically available on an hourly basis. So, we use a steady state assumption for all of the generation equipment except for the storage. And this is um, the, so the max settling time of any any of the generation parts of pieces of equipment that we're looking at would be about 15 minutes. That would be the, the chillers. So we're making this assumption that within a few minutes, all the equipment could be up and running in at steady state. So, we're at this is, so the only dynamic component of the problem is the storage. We are looking at a 24 hour time horizon. And there's no need really to go beyond 24 hours, and you'll see this pretty clearly in the results plot that we really only have two to six hours of full load storage on campus. And it, when you look at the plots, the storage actually looks fairly small, despite the fact that it's a four million gallon tank. But there's not much reason to go beyond 24 hours because we have a fairly small storage capacity and because we're looking at steady state models of everything but the storage. The storage dynamics are modeled fairly simply. We have the Total energy stored in the thermal energy storage is equal to what was stored in the previous hour plus whatever the plus our storage rate times delta T, and then we also have a loss term, which is about 4%. That would include pumping and convective losses. So the storage term here is just whatever we produce minus our turbine inlet cooling and minus the campus load. So this is an MINLP. Problem. It has approximately 600 decision variables. 216 of those are the binary constraints for the chillers. So the, this is the way I've implemented the binary constraints that the, the chiller load has to be within its high limit and its low limit. And then each of those limits is multiplied by the on off variable. 
this gave us much faster and much better convergence than implementing that variable directly on the, the other decision variable, the chiller logic. So there are also 264 nonlinear inequality constraints. I solved this, formulated the entire MINLP for the 24-hour period, and that took me 27 hours to solve it on this computer. So you can see that that's really not a tractable solution. If you want to solve this problem and actually implement something, you want to be solving it on the order of about 15 minutes to actually know in advance what to do with the chillers. If you solve this, it would be three hours beyond your last control variable before you actually do anything. So this is, from a practical and implementation point of view, this is not nearly good enough. Who solved the problem? I think the guy's name is Bonami. He worked with Larry Beagler. I did not. Sorry? Oh, yeah. He, uh, so I think that was with uh, work with Larry Beagler in their group at Carnegie Mellon. Okay. No, I did not try C flags on that. But, and the reason is yes. For one, for one day of operation, yeah. So what did you say about the key flex? So you said because of the key flex, you didn't try it. I just didn't try it. <laughs> yeah. Access to the license was the main thing. Although I think the key flex, I mean, somehow there's, you can get it, right? Yeah, I do believe that you can have one. And the, the main reason I didn't use it is because we found a better way to solve the problem, at least in my opinion, what, what is a better way. It's not the perfect way, but it was a good way that reduced this problem quite dramatically. So we are trying to make decisions every hour for 24 hours, but we also have decisions to make during each hour. We have the load at every hour, and we have even the inlet guide painting, the fluid flow rate at every hour. But the only dynamic component of the problem is the thermal energy storage. So I took this problem and I decomposed it into a set of, of static and dynamic optimization problems. So essentially what you do is you take your your charging rate for the thermal energy storage, you use that as your only decision variable for the dynamic problem. So you say, at hour one, this is going to be my charging rate, at hour two, it's going to be this. So you reduce the problem from 600 decision variables down to 24 decision variables. Given that charging rate, you have all the information you need to say, what's the, what's the best we can do at that charging rate? So if you have the charging rate, you know what your cooling load is at that hour, you, you know what your electrical loads are. So you solve a much smaller problem at each hour, and that essentially, and I wish one of these problems was working. So essentially, you feed down the charging rate, which is denoted here by U sub 1. The static problem solves at that particular hour. It tells you what all your variables should be at that hour. It feeds back the value of the objective function, in this case, the total cost or the total fuel rate. It feeds that back up to the dynamic problem. The dynamic problem will use all that information from each hour to compute numerical gradients and take its next iteration, at which point it sends that information back and the process is repeated. So even though you end up solving this static problem thousands of times, on the order of two to 3,000 times, it's solving very quickly, about, in about two seconds each. And you can solve this dynamic problem generally in about 20 to 30 minutes. So one of the downsides of this is that, so you don't want to be switching on and off the chillers a lot, and the power plant has indicated that's something they certainly don't want to do. So it's harder to, to enforce something like that with this formulation because we're not, the dynamic problem doesn't have access to what all the chillers are doing at every hour. There are other ways you could do this. You could have penalty terms um, based on the, on the binary variables that would introduce some discontinuities in your objective function. A better way to do this is to penalize the total change in cooling load. You don't want your system to be cooling at a total of 40 thermal megawatts one hour and then 120 the next hour. So if you can enforce some small penalties there, that handles most of the chillers switching on and off. And the nice part about this problem, actually, is that the storage makes the chillers turn on and off less than they would otherwise, because we're smoothing out the cooling load overall. So these are the results of that problem. that We're looking at here the total power output. This would be the steam turbine and the gas turbine combined. We're looking at the power that we export and sell to the grid and the price at which we're selling power. This is for a week in May, and I did this obviously for a whole year. I just pulled out some weeks that looked interesting to talk about. So here in black on this top plot, this is just the, the load that we're meeting. 
the blue and the blue is the solution to the static problem, assuming you're not using storage. The red is the solution to the dynamic problem, assuming that you do use storage. So here, for example, we're producing extra power, we're selling that power to the grid, but we don't have anything in the storage tank, so there's so those two are equal, the static and dynamic are equal here. The next day, however, you can see that price goes way up to $200 a megawatt hour, and naturally we want to take advantage of that. So what we do is we charge our tanks early, and as you can see, we're using more electricity with the dynamic problem. So we charge our tank. While we're still producing the same amount of power here, we're selling more of that power because the, the shifting of that cooling load has freed up electrical generation capacity we can, so we can sell a little bit more power to the tank here. You can see kind of some repeats of that. We charge here. We don't charge the system here because it's, the prices aren't, you can see that price is fairly flat. So the, the price isn't high enough to warrant trying to deal with the storage and the losses might, that might come from storage by, to try and free up some extra electrical generation capacity. So if we look at a week in July, this was last year, so, so 2012, the prices are, they fluctuate regularly. You can see we're getting some peak prices. We did double check. These prices do seem a little bit low, but double checking this week was fairly mild price-wise, but you can see we do have this nice fluctuation here that can really highlight the value of storage. And if you look closely, you can see that we're storing energy every day of the week there, and we're selling that extra energy here. So the storage lets us, even though we're not storing electricity directly, it frees up our electrical generation capacity and we can store a little bit of extra, um, we can produce a little bit of extra electricity, especially when prices get high. So this is a summary of the results. So this black bar here represents the scenario where we, it's a, so this isn't data directly from the power plant. I, because our data is kind of sparse and incomplete for the full year, I developed my own heuristic operating scheme. So you, so you load the chillers, you do what's called equal loading on the chillers where uh, we start with our most efficient chillers and there's some logic behind this. Given our total load, we look at these, the most efficient chillers, and we just equally distribute the load on most chillers. And then gradually, as the cooling load increases, we obviously have to add more and more chillers to meet that cooling capacity. Once the cooling capacity is determined, the power that's consumed by all the chillers will be fixed. And then I, I solved a separate optimization problem that told me where the power plant's going to run. So this optimization has a savings of about 2.2%. It could be a little bit better than that because I'm using optimal results from the rest of the system beyond the chillers. So we get about 2.2% savings by optimizing. That would be going from this curve down to here. One of the disappointing results of this whole work is that there is a marginal benefit for storing energy just to improve your efficiency of your system. The nice thing is, though, that we get an extra, about an extra six megawatts of peak capacity. So when prices skyrocket, I mean, they can get up to $1,000 per megawatt hour. And UT could presumably come in and have that extra six megawatt hours, six megawatts to produce during that time and, and generate a little bit of extra revenue. So I looked at the same problem essentially. So this problem was looking at only minimizing fuel costs. When we add in the ability to sell extra power and then in this scenario to buy and sell power, we get an additional 2.2% savings here. So going from from not storing to storing, when you're selling power to the grid, you get you save an extra 2.2 percent. And then here, um, when you can buy and sell power, now you can run your chillers. You can take advantage of low cost electricity from the grid and buy and sell. So overall, I calculated about two million dollars in savings total. That's going from this scenario all the way down to this scenario. And note that the scale here starts at 8.5 million. So this. So it's not like we're cutting those in half. I, I would call this a fairly moderate savings, given the, the trouble and the headache that the campus would have to go through in order to get to this scenario where they can freely buy and sell power from the grid. So great. my understanding is that the uh, tank, right, was put in, the decision was taken before the remaining discussion of all campus buying and selling, right? So I think I want to interpret what you said. I think what you're saying is that, in fact, the benefits from storage, if we're not talking about buying and selling, are pretty small. Is that, is that a correct interpretation? I think you said that, but I just want to make sure. So what did they, you know what the, um, what the utility folks expected, and how does your results compare to what they expected? Um, 
yeah, and again, my conclusion would be, yeah, just from an efficiency point of view, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't do much at all. Even so, there's about a forty thousand dollars in savings there. Which, and if you count the lost revenue from less parking, maybe it's a negative. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Correct, and I honestly I don't know exactly what into their what went into their decision making. This is to me the the biggest benefit is that we have this six megawatts electric peak capacity. I was in a discussion with the folks over at the power plant just a couple of weeks ago, and they are really anticipating needing that thermal energy storage tank as campus expands, especially when they start building the new medical school and there it's just a, just a peak reduction so so yeah from an efficiency standpoint there's at least my conclusion is that you probably don't need the tank but there will be some valuable benefits as the campus continues to expand we won't have to spend as much money investing into chillers so the storage tank is about one-third the cost of a new chilling station so it does offset buying new chilling equipment, and it actually offsets buying new uh, power generation equipment. So when they built that new medical campus south of here, um, they did so they run a couple of different scenarios looking at net present value. In the scenario where they didn't have a tank, they are going to have to build more generation capacity just to meet the medical school needs, or they're going to have to rely on the grid. And they came out with about a $35 million difference between the two, concluding that it was better to use our current storage tank and they were actually considering building another one so they minimize the peak hit that the new medical school brings on board so the benefits you brought are operating costs but what you what i think you just said was that their justification somehow was in terms of the avoided capital cost correct right? yes right Absolutely, no, no question. I, I just want to understand the, the, what you were saying versus why that they were doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And they had different reasons, and that's fine. I want to make sure it was you know, correct. Yeah, and, th and this was honestly a disappointing result for me to see that we didn't get much efficiency increase there. <clears throat> and I lost, yeah, lost my train of thought here. So the, okay, <laughs> I would I would like to insert the caveat here. Yeah, I, I found it. All right. So this is all done assuming that you can buy and sell freely on a, on a wholesale market. And there are lots of political reasons that that isn't exactly doable right now. So they have to, they have to purchase energy from Austin Energy, which would be a lot more expensive than wholesale market. So the buy and sell scenario may not be viable for them anyway. All right, so just to conclude and talk about some of the, the future work, as I have mentioned, this, this project, there was a lot of collaboration here. And certainly some of my collaborators are going to continue to answer some of the unanswered questions. But to conclude, energy storage equals flexibility. And instead of just using that flexibility to make your system operational, you can exploit that flexibility by optimization, and you can make your system perform better. This does require dynamic optimization, and it requires a way to forecast <laughs> your loads or even your supply. So renewables and fossil fuels can actually be synergistic. So thermal energy storage helps that process significantly in the case of our solar thermal system. I think it's, I think as a country, we sort of have the wrong paradigm with solar energy. We're trying to build systems that are completely 100% solar, dependent on solar, but I think we can actually extract more energy if we let the, if we try and maximize the solar and assume that we have fossil fuels to, to rely on in the event that there isn't enough solar to, to meet our loads totally. I think systems could be uh, redesigned with that in mind. So for UT, there's a small benefit for using the thermal energy storage just to improve efficiency. But there's a significant benefit if we look at an open market scenario, and it certainly will reduce our peak for campus extension. Some topics that haven't been answered in my work um, are looking at the stochastic nature of the problems that we're dealing with. There is uncertainty in the forecast. There's uncertainty in our model. So we need to look at how to deal with those uh, from a stochastic point of view. Having a good real-time implementation strategy, like the model predictive control strategy that Dr. Baldick mentioned, would help to alleviate a lot of the uncertainties that go along with running the system. One thing that I'm particularly interested in, and I'm going to work for ExxonMobil, so I'll have to do this in my spare time, but I'm really interested in designing some of those 
hybrid system and looking at new ways to put together um, renewables and fossil fuels so that you maximize the amount of solar energy that you can get. And I think there's a big component to integrating that operation into a, a smarter design. And I've done some brainstorming on different configurations, but I may have to pass that off to someone else. So I just want to summarize some of my contributions that I've made um, during my PhD. As you've read through, through my dissertation, each chapter is a paper that I either have submitted or plan on submitting in the near future. So I won't go through these in detail, but some of the highlights would be the novel use of storage to enhance the hybrid operation of a solar thermal slash fossil fuel power plant. Um, load forecasting, I thought, even although that's not really a novel methodology, we haven't seen anything in literature where they've done this with a system like this where you're looking at heating, cooling, and electrical. So we have a really unique system, so that's more taking advantage of a really unique system to, to show people that you can produce pretty accurate forecasts, limited knowledge. So I developed this uh, decoupling method where you take the dynamic problem and you break it up into a series of static problems. I think that's, that's a going to have a good impact on solving these types of problems. Um, other works that I've seen where they're using thermal energy storage to do this, to improve the efficiency of your system, they linearize everything to make the problem a lot simpler. But if you're looking at linear models of the chillers, it's going to throw off your prediction of how the chillers will perform totally. So I don't, I don't consider that to be a viable method. So while this kind of simplifies the problem, we don't lose any of the accuracy of our models and we don't lose any of the flexibility that storage provides our system. And finally, if there are a lot of people I'd like to acknowledge, the National Science Foundation, who has funded my research, in addition to the UT Office of Sustainability. My research group, I love you guys. Um, I've worked really closely with several members that I've highlighted, so, and these are listed in alphabetical order. Those who have had a direct impact on this project, the West, Felix, who was an undergrad working for us, Greedy, John, and Akshay. I've worked very closely with John Hedengren on, on some of these topics, and in addition to his graduate student, Jose Mojica. The UT Energy and Utilities Management team have been exceptional, and the more I interact with them and the more I've poured through their data, the more I've realized these are really smart people and they're running the system exceptionally well. And I would also like to thank Rockwell Automation, who has interfaced with us. Creed is actually working for them now as an intern, and they've provided some pretty good insights into how to solve these problems. And now to conclude, are, are there any questions? 